I want to talk to you about a subject that uh, has just been in my um, heart uh, for, I guess, several weeks now, and I wasn't quite sure um, where to deal with this issue, but I thought since um, I had an opportunity to talk with you some on a Wednesday night that this would be a good, a good time to um, sort of open this subject. I want to talk to you about identity, identity. I, I'm convinced um, that identity is so important. In fact, I remember when uh, Brother uh, David Bernard, who is our uh, general superintendent and um, has been here with us uh, before, and he is doing such a great job leading the United Pentecostal Church International. I, I remember when he first took office, which has maybe been 10 years ago now, he had already been a successful um, pastor in Austin, Texas, and uh, was an honors graduate in law school, University of, of Texas. He's, he's written, I don't know, 25 books. He's, he's a brilliant man, uh, has an unbelievable work ethic, is a person of character. We're really blessed as an organization to be under his leadership. But I remember when he took um, office as the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church, that he... Um, he established three things um, to focus on as a movement. And uh, one of those things was apostolic identity. And uh, in talking about apostolic identity, he really talked about the things that were critical uh, for us to identify with uh, as a church. And I, I think that it's identity is something that's probably like the word faith and that we kind of know what it is, but it's not really easy to kind of get your arms around it. Um, but I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to look to 1 Kings chapter 22 and read uh, just a few verses about this story. And then um, I'll just uh, summarize it as we get into it uh, because the story is quite interesting. And, it, and it's, it's the end of 1 Kings and, and the beginning of 2 Kings. But I'll... Uh, I'll just read a few verses, and this is sort of the um, the, the high point of, of this story as it unfolds. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, let me just stop and, and say this, the king of Israel is Ahab, and the king of Judah is Jehoshaphat. And they're coming together at this point to do a sort of a um, combining their forces together, um, and they're they're wanting to... Uh, go after Syria and, and redeem an, an area uh, of land that they had held previously, but they had lost under Syrian rule. And so they decided to come together and to sort of join forces. Uh, 1 Kings 22 and 30, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself. Now, if there's one thing we've learned about Ahab, and that is that he is a weak leader. He's really a coward in a lot of ways and had really segregated even his entire rule as king uh, to Jezebel, his wife. And they, they had really just turned totally against the God of Israel and, and they were worshipers of idolaters and worshipers of Baal and so forth. And he was a person that was always kind of looking for a way to sort of uh, pass the buck, so to speak. And here he decides when they go into battle that he will disguise himself. He says, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. In other words, now King Jehoshaphat, we'll go into battle together, but you go ahead and wear your robes that signifies that you're the king, but I will disguise myself. And of course, he's doing this. Uh, if anybody's targeting the king, they would target Jehoshaphat and not him so he wants to disguise himself in some ways it could be said that he was changing his identity for what he thought was in his best interest and that was to be um, camouflaged as it were or to have a different identity in battle but put thou on thy robes, and the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. The king of Syria, this is of course their opponent, commanded his thirty and two captains 
that had rule over his chariots. So he, the king of Syria, has got 32 captains that are in charge of all the chariots and all those warriors and the fighting that, that goes on um, in the chariots, you know. Um, he says that these 32 captains, which I'm sure were some of his best soldiers, fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. In other words, I want all I want you guys to do is target the king of Israel. I don't want you trying to kill the other, you know, foot soldiers, the chariot drivers. I want you just to target the king of Israel. So that's their assignment. There's 32 of them. They're going after Ahab, the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots, that's these 32 guys, saw Jehoshaphat, because he's, he's wearing his king's robes, that they said, surely it is the king of Israel. So they see Jehoshaphat, and it would appear at this point that Ahab's strategy was working because they were targeting uh, Jehoshaphat because of the attire that he was wearing. That they said, surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. Now, Jehoshaphat sees that they've all turned to come after him. And Jehoshaphat, realizing now he's been set up by King Ahab, he starts to say, hey, I'm not King Ahab. I'm not the king of Israel. And it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. So they thought they had saw him. They, they thought Jehoshaphat was him. He wasn't. When he hollered out and corrected, they saw it wasn't him. They turned from pursuing Jehoshaphat. And a certain man, drew a bow at a venture. Now, I'm sure in close range, they're, they're fighting with bows and arrows and they would target individuals. But then there were some that would just draw a bow back and would just launch it, hoping that it would land somewhere, um, find its mark, and, and, and do its purpose. And so that's what happened. A certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel, this is Ahab, between the joints of the harness, where the armor comes together in the joint of the har harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, this is Ahab, turn thy hand and carry me out. Turn thine hand, he's wanting to turn the chariot around. And carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Just by chance, even though he's disguised, he has changed his identity. The chance bow, which probably was not by chance at all. God directed the little stone in David's sling. I'm sure he could direct this arrow. And, he, and, and, and Ahab ends up dying uh, from this. The, the, the longer I live the more convinced I am that the power of identity is the single greatest contributor to the decisions that we make on a daily basis. The power of identity is the single greatest contributor to the decisions that we make. There's a famous saying that I think is so true. It goes like this. We are not who we think we are. And we are not who others think that we are. But we are who we think others think we are. Now, I hope that makes sense. We're not who we think we are. We're not necessarily who others think we are. But we, we are or we try to be what we think other people perceive us as. And so identity is something that evolves. It's not like a light switch that's suddenly turned on. Uh, identity is not random. Identity comes from our experiences and our values, and it's greatly influenced by our self-esteem and our social interaction. But most of all, most of all, we get our identity from what we love. We get our identity identity from what we are passionate about that's why you've always got to guard your heart you've got to guard your heart because what you fall in love with 
what you allow the emotions of your heart to sort of wrap itself around, it will become the greatest contributor to your identity and the decisions that you make. You, you see this, there's numerous examples, but you see it in, in how people love uh, football and they love their favorite team and they will buy jerseys to wear around. And uh, it, it's, it's their identity. And that, that team wins, they're happy. That team loses, they're depressed all weekend. <laughs> Do you know people that are like that? It's, it's because that's what they love and so they identify with it. And when, when, a, when a team wins a, a Super Bowl, everybody in the whole city has a big parade because their identity became that team because that team was the source of their passion. Now, here's what we know as Christians that and we have numerous passions. We have things that we like. But everybody has a master passion, the thing that you love above everything else. And to really truly identify as a New Testament Christian, your master passion has to be Jesus Christ. Anything else that you love that continues to grow and your love for Jesus is kind of squeezed out, it will become less and less of a priority and your identity becomes more and more associated with the other things that you're pursuing. That's why everything in life has to be prioritized based upon you having a master passion that says above all else, I must be saved. It doesn't mean that you can't like, you know, swimming or tennis or have hobbies or, uh, you know, travel and take pictures of the beautiful Grand Canyon. I mean, we all are blessed to, to have a, a life that billions of people in this world would die for. And we, we have it every day. We're blessed, 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 blessed beyond measure in America. We live, I was telling this to a friend of mine recently, we live in a country, most of the world is trying to find food. We're trying to figure out how not to eat so much food. What a blessed people we are. I, I watched people walk around and try to find clean water with little blue uh, UN, United Nation buckets, trying to just scoop and water out of a mud puddle and parasites all over it. I mean, the, most of the world, it, it's hard to even get your brain around unless you've traveled and seen it firsthand, but there, there's most of this world is, is, is trying to find a way to sustain themselves. And here we are with all these blessings that we've been given. What, what a great God we serve. But don't ever let the, the affluence of our culture or the, the blessings of our, of, of our country to... Uh, crowd out that that special place in your heart that puts Jesus on the throne of not just the throne of this world and the throne of eternity but the throne of your heart and my heart we, we've got a single throne every one of us and there's something that's sitting on it what is it it can be another relationship it can be finances it can be uh, us trying to get our identity from being successful at work but all of those things cannot be our master passion. It cannot be what truly identifies us. You can't camouflage who you are. I, I, I've known people to, to grow up in the church and, and, you know, when they're coming to church, they dress like they're Pentecostal and then go to school and have other attire in their locker and try to live as a camouflage Christian in a public school. You're not doing yourself any service. There's going to be a, a stray arrow that's going to find you. There's going to be somebody that says something that's going to lodge in your heart and spirit. You, when you take on the identity of being a born-again Christian, and thank God for people that live a lifestyle of holiness. Now, I know there's sometimes ridicule in the world, but we're not trying to please the world. We're trying to please God. He's the trier of our hearts. And I'm sure there's other things that we could do that are not sins that would put us in hell, but yet we draw the line way back here. Why is that? Because we're trying to identify with a cause and a movement and a biblical principle that's bigger than ourselves. 
Sure, there may be ways to be more comfortable and, and, and to dress in a more provocative manner in the hot summer of Florida, but I thank God for men and women in this church that say we're not ashamed, hallelujah, to be associated with being able to walk with God in a way that brings dignity to the cause of Christ by the way we present ourselves to this world. I know it's the blood of Jesus that saved us, but I'm thankful for the identity. Some of the times that we put these standards in our life, it's not so that we can say we're better than everybody else. And I know that identity is much more than dress, but let me at least deal with this aspect of it for just a moment. I know it's much bigger than that, but when you associate with people of holiness and people of character, people of, of righteousness. You're saying to yourself, I am identifying with something that is righteous. I'm identifying with something that is a called out, chosen unto God. And when you do that, you are setting, I believe, a protection around yourself, around your spirit, around your mind, and around your family. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm thankful for people that still believe in that in the 21st century. And I know it's not popular, but it is still biblical principles that we live by. If we simply follow culture, we will find ourselves shipwrecked. Now, let's talk about this story that we read for just a moment. The last chapter of 1 Kings, and as I said, the first chapter in 2 Kings is a, is a great lesson on the power of identity. The Syrians, you know, they're here hanging around Ramoth Gilead. That's the area that uh, Jehoshaphat and Ahab had come together to try to uh, retake it and uh, Jehoshaphat says you know to Ahab you know my people are your people your people are my people your army is my army so forth so let's go but he said before we go let's see what the Lord says and so um, Ahab calls 400 prophets but they're pretty much yes men uh, the king had learned uh, to call certain people that would just come and tell him what he wanted to hear uh, one, one guy named Zedekiah, he, uh, he knew uh, the right way to live. He knew what it was to hear from God. But he had, had pretty much thrown all of that up in the air to just please the king and tickle his ears. Fortunately, Christianity has become that in so many circles. It's just tickling people's ears. It's cotton candy when we need substance. We need meat and potatoes. We need the doctrine of the word of God, the identity of who Jesus is. And Zedekiah was sort of the leader of these 400 prophets. And he makes these little horns and puts them on his head, little iron horns, the Bible says. And he runs around with his head down, you know, and uh, he's doing all this little drama before King Ahab, and he says, this is what you're going to do to the Syrians. And he's got his little horns, you know, and all that. And they're all plotting. And he runs around, you know, and all the other prophets. And they're all, it's just a big show. And Jehoshaphat, who still has a, uh, a place in his spirit when he can tell something's not of God, he still has a sensitivity to what's real and what's not real. He says, are there any other prophets around that we can talk to? And Ahab says, yeah, there's this guy, Micaiah, but he's a bad prophet. I really don't like him because he always prophesies against me. <laughs> now, here's the thing about Micaiah. He has a strong identity of who he is. He says, my identity is that I tell you what I hear God tells me. Thank God for that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the world needs. The world is full of positive motivators. The world is full of of personalities that are, uh, you know, charismatic in nature and have a, a, a winning personality. That's not what the world needs. The world's full of those kind of people. 
But what the world needs is a word from God. And people that will say, this is what thus saith the word of God. It may not be what you want to hear. It may not be what I want to hear. But thank God that there's a voice in our midst that we can believe is from the Lord. And we're, we're blessed as a people if we have that. Now, this particular prophet, he had a strong identity. That when you have a strong identity, you're not afraid of the truth. When your identity is weak in terms of your Christian identifying with the cause of Christ and with biblical principles, you're, you're sort of tossed to and fro all the time. And you're, you're like this Ahab. You've got to put on a different garment for every circumstance you're in. I'm going to battle now. I got to put on this garment. Now I'm over here. I got to put on this garment. Now this person says, "Have you ever talked with people?" I have friends. I saw this even recently in a conversation. It was so funny. I had a person that was talking to me about a certain uh, situation that was going on, and boy, they just had such strong opinions. And it wasn't like 15 minutes later uh, that we were in a, uh, the same person. We we're in another setting. There was another individual now that was presenting the. Uh, the alternate viewpoint of what they had just been so adamant about. And the alternate viewpoint was presented in a very forceful manner. And the person who had just had the opposing view, he automatically agreed with the person that's now making the counterpoint. And I'm like, I thought you were just saying A. And now you believe B. You know people that are like that? They're like these lizards that run around in our yards. They just, they kind of change colors based on, they're on the fence post or they're on the, if they're on a leaf, they turn green. If they're on the sidewalk, I can't keep up with it. Whatever happened to just being who you are? And if you're, if you have an identity, it doesn't mean that you go around trying to find a way to be rude and to be crude, but you just say, this is who I am. I believe in the word of God. And people ask you questions, well, does that mean this is going to happen? Does that mean that's going to happen? Does that mean this is going to happen? Some, somebody the other day asked uh, uh, Gregory, my son Gregory, he was telling me about this, um, somebody he works with. Where's Tim Jenkins? It's one of Tim Jenkins' workers. Is Tim even in here or is he busying himself with something else? Decided to clean a bathroom or something in the middle of Bible study. Some of these guys will only work on the church during Wednesday night. I feel a pastoral spirit come over me right now. God forbid they won't come here on Tuesday night. But Wednesday night, they find a lot to get. The whole church will all be fixed by the time this service is over tonight. It'll be amazing. Oh, goodness. But this guy that, uh, that was working with Gregory, and Gregory... Uh, you know, I think they knew that he was a, a Bible quizzer or something, so he wanted to ask him a question. And he said to him, you know a lot about the Bible? And Gregory's like, I, no, not really. I mean, I'm just a Bible quizzer. He said, well, he said, let me ask you a question. Uh, according to the Word of God, is it like a sin, like you're not going to go to heaven if you commit suicide? And uh, Gregory said, yeah, you're not, you know, if you commit suicide, your body is a temple, you're taking your life, you know, you're... You're, you're basically doing the opposite of what God created you to do and so forth. So he explains that. And the guy said, okay, that's what I thought. I had heard that. But he said, now here's the question I have. When 9-11 happened and people were way up in the building and the building was on fire and they jumped off the building and committed suicide, did those people go to heaven or hell? People love asking Christians these questions, don't they? <laughs> So Gregory said, you know, here's what I told him. Because I don't know if it's the right answer or not, but this is what I said. And he said, I told him that I didn't think those people were going to hell because they weren't really committing suicide. They, they were jumping, but the building was already on fire. And so they were not doing that out of choice. They were forced into that position. I said, I couldn't have said it better myself, son. That, in fact, I'm glad you told me that. Now I know how to answer somebody if they ever ask me. <laughs> I, I don't know people are always wanting to ask us now you know the bible right you're the pastor you know this okay is this person going to heaven or hell? i don't know i'm so glad i don't know because there's only one that's making that decision and it's not me 
It's the Lord. He's the judge. And I'm so glad he's the one because guess what? He's more merciful than all of us. I'm glad he's the only one making the decision. If it was a committee making a decision, I'm so glad I don't believe in the Trinity. If you believe there's three persons on three thrones, who's making the decision where you go for eternity? Is there a group discussion? Is it two out of three? It's so complicated. I'm glad I know here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And he's a merciful God. So we don't, we don't try to have all of the answers. All we know is this. We know that we love Jesus with all of our heart, and we're trying to live according to the Word of God. It doesn't mean that we have all of the answers about who's going where and what's going to happen to Aunt Betty and Uncle Ernie. I don't know, but I know Jesus. Hallelujah. And I know what the Word of God says. And so I have to walk in light as it is revealed to me. And the Bible has made it clear. You've got to repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you don't have to be afraid of the truth. You can be strong in who you are and in your identity and not have to try to change your cloak based upon who you're talking to or what situation you're in. Now, the servant that goes to get Micaiah, so Jehoshaphat says, I really, um, I don't want to offend you, King Ahab, but I don't really trust that 400. That was a big dog and pony show. Now, I'm using modern day vernacular, but you understand what I'm saying. He says, let's, let's bring this guy. And he, and he even tells, uh, this is so interesting when you read it. King James Version shares it in some of the wording that may get lost in there. But Jehoshaphat tells King Ahab, you really shouldn't say that. Because Jehoshaph, uh, Jehoshaphat told Ahab, because Ahab just says, I hate the guy. I just don't like him. And he says, you really shouldn't say that. And so... The servant goes to get uh, Micaiah and, and tells him that all the other prophets have been saying um, very nice things to the king. So we need you to just go along. Um, he said, they want you to come. And we've already heard from 400 prophets. <laughs> Here comes the peer pressure. We've already heard from 400 prophets. They've all told the king that he should go to battle and that they're going to have great victory. And so, you know, just want to let you know that ahead of time. Have you ever noticed something that children do that's quite interesting? When they want permission to do something, and they go to their mom and they say, Mom, can we go do whatever it is? And the mom says, I don't know, ask your father. They go to the father and they say, Mom said we could go do da-da-da-da as long as it's okay with you. Have you ever noticed that kids do that? I know they do because I did it when I was a kid. That's not exactly what happened. But they know the other parent is more likely to give permission if they think the other parent has. So they frame it in a way that kind of puts peer pressure on the other parent. Uh, maybe not peer pressure, maybe more like spousal pressure. But it's still the same thing in that it's trying to influence the decision in a certain way. When this servant came to this prophet, he says to him, the, the other 400 uh, have already said that it's okay. Okay? 400. You're one. This is what's happening in our culture today. They're wanting you to feel like that you are isolated in your value system. The rest of the world all thinks this way, but you're the oddball. You're the cyclop with one eye in the middle of your head. You're some Igor because you believe the word of God. Don't buy into all of that. We have got to do the same thing that this prophet did. He says this, I can only say what the Lord has shown me. 
I don't know about what you did with 400 prophets. I don't know about this alliance now between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. I don't know what all you guys have got working, what y'all got cooking. Here's the only thing I can tell you. I just simply say what the Lord has told me to say. Thank the Lord for people like that. Hallelujah. And they just say, you can figure it all out. You can have all know the nuances of this and that. Here's what I know. I just know I'm going to live by the principles of the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to draw a line in the sand and we're going to make a commitment. And we stay on that, stay grounded on that. That uh, is what this particular prophet was doing. And there's something powerful about it. The only way you can do that is if you identify with uh, not just what's in your own, what appears to be in your own personal best interest, but what is uh, the real truth of God's word. So he, they, bring the, uh, they bring this prophet in and he tells the king sarcastically, yeah, go to battle. You're going to have a glorious victory. Okay, what do you think we should do? You know, we've had 400 prophets say this and that. And this is King Jehoshaphat. And he asked for you to come. And this is my... And they do the whole deal. What do you say? Well, yeah, fine, whatever. You want to go to battle? I think you're going to have a glorious victory. <laughs> and the king knows that he's not telling the truth because he's heard his prophecies before. And the king says, now, now tell us the truth. You, you have to really tell us what the Lord has told you. Be honest, Micaiah. And Micaiah tells the king what he saw. He saw in a vision all the sheep of Israel that were scattered because they had no king. And the Lord said, let each of them go peaceably to their house. And Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and says, see didn't I tell you, this guy always prophesies against me. He's making it personal. When it was basically, do you want to hear from God or not? We, we have to have an identity that says, as Christians, we're not going to just be Christians that take the path of least resistance. I feel like that as a world, we are moving toward a, a time when you're, you're going to have to make a stand as to whether or not you really believe this Bible. The, the, the middle ground is all going to get weeded out. You know, we talked the other day about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot coming, you know, with his wife and his daughters out of Sodom because the Lord sent angels and told them they got to go. Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed by fire so they go out and the lord told them to go to the mountain they don't go to the mountain they say can we go to zor it's got palm trees hey they had palm trees <laughs> and the bible says it was and it had palm trees and it was well watered so they said can we just go to zor and 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 the lord said fine let's go to zor that's not what he told them to do initially though there's a lot of times where the lord will tell you to do something and you'll say oh that's wonderful lord but i'm going to do this is that okay You can see it, you'll see it with Balaam in the Bible. He, eventually, he'll just let you do what you want to do. It doesn't mean it's God's will. It means it's your will. And so, uh, Lot did, but it, it was in Zor where his wife turns around and looks back in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Zor gives people a false sense of security. And Zor is where a lot of Christianity is, especially in America right now. They're living in Zor. They're not where they're supposed to be spiritually on the mountain. And yet we look over at Sodom and Gomorrah and we go, oh, thank God we're not as wicked as those poor people. We're over here in Zor. But remember this, if you don't remember anything else, the wicked die in Sodom, but the righteous die in Zor. And we are moving at a time, I believe with all of my heart, that we're moving to a time where Zor is going to get cleaned out. And it's going to boil down to whether or not we really are willing to make the trip to the spiritual mountain. See, Lot didn't want to go up there. He's like, I'm not a mountain kind of guy. I'm, you know, I'm more of a city guy. And I just want to stay down here. I'm afraid some beast will overtake me if I go to the mountain. I'm not, you know, some sort of a cave man. I'm not, you know, some guy that's used to all of the mountain living. That's not me. I'd rather just stay down here and, and you know, in the valley. But I'm going to tell you what. There's coming a time 
where you won't mind making the trip. After he lost his wife in Zor, the next morning he got up and told his daughters, we're going to the mountain. Why wait until there's a catastrophe for us to become what God has called us to be? I say let's take the trip to the mountain and say, Lord, wherever you're at, like Moses said before they left Egypt, God, if you don't go with us, we're not going into the desert. But where your spirit leads, we will follow. Oh, hallelujah. you got to be willing to make that tough decision and say, I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do, what the Lord has put in my heart and in my spirit, and I'm not going to be afraid, and I'm not going to be ashamed. That's having that identity, that master passion. So, uh, Micaiah says, I, I saw the Lord on a throne with all the host of heaven, and he asked, who would persuade King Ahab to go to battle? And he said, I saw different ones come forward with different plans. But then a spirit stood before him, and he said, he was a lying spirit, and he said, I will persuade the king by having all the prophets tell him to go. This, this prophet, this true prophet of God, stands before Ahab and Jehoshaphat, knowing that they can take his life. But he just simply says what the Lord told him. He said, I saw it in a vision. I knew what was going to happen. And he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, they don't have a king, and they're like scattered sheep, and they're going back to their homes. I told them to go peacefully. But he said, who would persuade the king to do something like this that was not what the Lord had instructed? And he says, I saw these different ones coming, and I saw this spirit. And he said, how did you persuade? He said, I had the prophets tell him to go. I mean, when Zedekiah, you remember Zedekiah, the guy with the little horns? The guy who was basically a, a backslider that had decided that he was more concerned with being politically connected than being spiritually connected. Zedekiah heard this, and he goes over and slaps this prophet and said, when did the Lord pass me up and start speaking to you? I can tell you, Zedekiah, when that happened. When you came more concerned about the king's opinion than God's opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to make sure in these last days, I don't know if we've got weeks left, days left, months left, but we've got to make sure that there is something inside of our spirit that is tuned into God that says, Lord, I want to please you more than anything else. I've got to please God. It's so crucial. Ahab gets mad. He throws him in prison, tells the guards, don't feed him anything except bread and water till we have a victory. And of course, Ahab goes out there, disguises himself, thinking that will be a defense. It was actually the opposite. He's killed in battle. And it wasn't just his generation. It continued down to the next generation. It all had happened because King Ahab had lost his identity a long time ago. He was supposed to be a righteous man, and he was not. He was supposed to be a king, but he wasn't a leader. He had no identity because he had sold out. You can sell your house. You can sell your car. But ladies and gentlemen, don't ever sell your identity. And I want to say this for whatever it's worth, because I just feel prompted in the Holy Ghost to add this. Just because you've made a mistake, don't let that mistake become your identity. You are a child of God. You can ask God to forgive you and he'll put it under the blood. That is not who you are. You are a child of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. And don't let the mistakes define who you are. You've got to get an identity that I am the king's kid. I have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you've got to be convinced of that. The next chapter tells us about Ahab's son, uh, Ahaziah, who becomes king, and he worships Baal. Uh, he falls and he's injured and, and sends his servants to the temple of Baal to find out uh, if he will live. He, he, he's doing the same thing. While they're traveling, the prophet Elijah God's always going to have a prophet. God's always going to have a voice in any generation, in any culture. If people are hungry, God's going to always have a vessel that he can use. 
And Elijah gets word that they're sending these, these prophets up there to try to get the word from Baal. And Elijah gets word from, from the Lord um, what's going on. And he cuts them off at the pass and he tells them, why are you going to the, to the temple of Beelzebub? Is there not a God in Israel? I'm like, no, we're just doing what we're told. He said, go tell the king he will not recover, he will die. So the servants go back and, and say to the king, and they, what, the king says, what happened? And well, we never got there, but we found a guy. This guy crossed our paths, and uh, this is why we're back so fast. I mean, the king, how have you already come back? I thought you had to go way up there. No, we, well, what happened was this guy, before we got there, uh, we were headed there, but this prophet came out, and he, he told us you know, to go back. We didn't have to go, and he already had a word from the Lord, and he, he told us that, that you wouldn't recover. It wasn't us. We just ran into a guy that told us to tell you that. The king says, what did he look like? And they said, he was a hairy man. He had a garment of leather around his midsection. And the king said, I know who that is. That's Elijah the Tishbite. And he sends um, 50 men and a captain to go get him. And the captain says, you want us to go get the man of God? Yes. He says, okay. So they go to get him. Elijah's sitting up there on top of the hill, and they're like, by the order of the king, you must come down from that hill and go with us. We're going to take you back. And Elijah says, if I am truly a man of God, I want fire to come down and consume these men. <laughs> fire comes down and consumes them all. I mean, Elijah knows how to call fire down. You remember he got that thing going in Mount Carmel and so fire comes down and consumes all these 50 guys and the captain. They all burn to a crisp. And so the king's like, what happened? And they're like, they all got burned by fire. Oh, you got to be kidding me. All right, 50 more guys. Come on, guys, line up. Here's what I want you to do. I need you all to go down there and get the prophet Elijah. He's sitting up there on the hill. Tishbite, yeah. We need you to bring him to us. Didn't we already send a search party? Yeah, they didn't make it. Oh, I can hear them all whispering to each other. What happened to those guys? I heard they all burnt to a crisp. Okay. So they all go, and they're probably a lot more polite than the first group was. You know, Elijah, it'd be nice for you to come down and join us. You know, we're going to go back. And it's just, you know, a good thing to do. And show that you're, you know, concerned about your country and the king. And Elijah says, if I be the man from God, let fire come down and consume. Fire comes down and consumes them all again. And the captain. They're all done. Word gets back to the king, the second group that went, and they're, they're toast. And um, he says, that's fine. We'll get 50 more men. The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing <laughs> over and over, <laughs> thinking you're going to have a different result, right? So uh, the third group comes, and by this time they've become a little wiser. And the captain says, I know that you are a man of God. Please do not call fire down. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord says to Elijah, go, don't be afraid, go with them. And there's a couple of things that jump out at me from that. Number one is, it was the humility of this man that changed the heart of God. The angel convinced the prophet not to call fire down because this captain, who I'm sure was a Baal worshiper and was not a believer in the God of Elijah, but he recognized the identity of Elijah. Folks, I cannot stress enough the power of identity. Even people that may not like you, they know that you have a walk with God. And that's more important than anything else. What does it matter to be popular? You know, whenever the, they had Meany, Meany, Tibble, Farsons written on the wall there in that big, crazy debauchery party, whatever Belshazzar was throwing and, and babbling and all of that when they'd conquered Media Persia and they... 
They had to saw this hand come out of the wall and write on what in the world is going on and who's what what does mean anything with you farson mean and they went and got Daniel you know out and they said Daniel can you interpret it and Daniel interprets and he said your kingdom has been weighed in the balances and found wanting and they said oh that's beautiful we want to give you a big gold ring we want you to be in the party come here come over here take a drink you know and put this on your head put the ring on your finger and put a gold chain around your neck and you know what Daniel tells them you can keep all of that. Because tonight your kingdom will be taken from you. That very night, the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. Here's the point. The point is this. Daniel could have sold his identity to be a part of the crowd. And he would have perished with all of the others that night. But thank God for somebody that's willing to stand and say, that's not who I am. That's not what I associate with. I am a child of God. And if you identify as a child of God, ladies and gentlemen, you have more power than you realize. It is the principle that Jesus was teaching his disciples. He said, whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. You don't have that power unless you identify with Jesus Christ. That's the power of identity. That's why the disciples baptized in the name of Jesus. That's why they prayed for the sick in the name of Jesus. That's why they preached Jesus. That's why they cast out devils in Jesus. Because they realized that the power of his identity, they did not believe that he was the the Messiah, they being the community, they being the Jewish hierarchy. They didn't believe that Jesus was a Messiah. They thought he was a heretic. But the disciples linked themselves to the identity of Jesus. The identity of who Jesus was became the identity of who they are. That's why there's power in understanding who Jesus Christ is. That's why remission of sins is through his blood. Our power to live above sin is based in the identity of who Jesus Christ is. And our power to defeat the enemy is in our identity with Jesus Christ. Now I got just a couple of minutes. Let me close with this. We've, we've started uh, a, a new program that we, we're starting to do interviews again and we're, we're doing, we're calling this the wind and the word and the other uh, the other day, I, I guess it was yesterday, um, I'm losing track of time because of these crazy landscapers. <sighs> but anyways, during the day uh, yesterday, I interviewed um, uh, Pastor Joel Urshan, and it's, I, I think we've released it on YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff. But we're going to each week have a, a, a new, and, and so we did uh, just like a 30-minute interview, and we talked a little bit about uh, different aspects of the season that we're in. And, and if, if you get a chance uh, to look at it, I think it would be beneficial. But this one little clip that I just wanted to show you is, is when I ask Pastor Urshan about one of, the, one of the things, even as we're planning this conference that's coming up here in a few weeks, that, that has been so um, impactful is that, you know, we've talked about how we want to have an apostolic environment and have the prophetic winds of God blowing. And Brother Joel Urshan is always very... Um, he's very uh, important part of that discussion and he makes an emphasis on us uh, being uh, committed to the doctrine it not just be in the spirit but committed to the doctrine of the Word of God and so I asked him a little bit about that because when we talk about the wind and the word we're talking about the spirit and truth the Bible said he seeketh worshipers that worship in spirit and truth and so we talk about for just a moment I want, I want you to hear what Pastor Urshan says about identity you said you know it's important to have uh, that doctrinal balance uh, with the prophetic wind of God. And I wonder if you could talk about that for just a second and, and how the, the doctrine, the truth of God's word uh, serves as a foundation for the anointing of God's word. That's a great, that's a great observation. And, and there is something about the identity of God that really sets the stage for everything. It sets the foundation for everything else. Uh, he said to Moses, you tell them I am hath sent you. And that understanding of him being the I am was so necessary to what Moses was going to do uh, in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, and it really emboldened Moses. It, him understanding who God was took away the insecurity of who he felt he was. 
uh, you know, there was something that Moses kept saying to God when God would tell him all that he was going to do there in speaking to Pharaoh, Moses would say, who am I? Who am I? He said that a couple of times, who am I? And I think that's an interesting question because God's response to it was always, I am, I am. So the, the response to our insecurity is always his identity. We have to stop worrying about where we may be inadequate and just start looking at the sovereignty, the power, and the, the glory, the omnipotence of God. And in Genesis chapter one, you know, the scripture says, God said, let there be light. Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. That word, let there be, is the word I am. It's the same word that he used when he told Moses who was sending him into Egypt. It's the word Haya, I am, to exist, the self-existent one. And so when God said, let there be light, what brought light to the earth was his identity. I, I am light. And then the whole world was illuminated. The whole world is not illuminated by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Those were created on the fourth day. There was light before there were, there was a sun or a moon or stars. It's the light that shines above the brightness of the sun as it did as Saul was riding down the road to Damascus. It's not the brightness of the sun. It's above the brightness of the sun. And that, that's, that's that doctrinal truth, the identity of who God is. If people can really understand who God is uh, as best as we can through the word, the revelation of the word, it really gives people the wherewithal to let him move in their life. It puts everything in perspective if they know who God is. It begins to help them know who they are. It helps them to know who they're, who they're not. They're not what the devil has said they are. They're not who the accuser has said they are because the more they understand about who he is, uh, the more they'll understand who they are and the more his spirit will have opportunity to truly perfect and, and perform the work needed in their lives. Uh, see, to me, that's just brilliant. He's saying, if you, if you can wrap yourself in the identity of who Jesus is, you become stronger in your own identity when you know his identity. Jesus, how much more should all of us that associate with the name of Jesus be committed to an apostolic identity that we are his child, no matter what may come or go, I can be secure in who I am, not because of my own ability, but because in the fact that he has revealed himself to us. That's why the apostles had something. That's why the post-apostolic fathers had something that others didn't have. Because they embraced the identity. Let's stand to our feet. Once you have that revelation, you can join me in making this declaration. Today, I am stepping across the line. I am tired of waffling, and I'm finished with wavering. I've made my choice. The verdict is in, and my decision is irrevocable. I'm going God's way, and there's no turning back. I will spend the rest of my life serving God's purposes with God's people on God's planet to God's glory. I will use my life to celebrate his presence, cultivate his character, participate in his family, demonstrate his love, and communicate his word. Since my past has been forgiven and I've been baptized in his name, I refuse to waste any more time on shallow living, petty thinking, trivial talking, thoughtless doing, useless regretting, hurtful resentment, or faithless worrying. Instead, I will magnify God, grow to maturity, serve in ministry, and fulfill my mission in the membership of his family. Because this life is preparation for the next. I will value worship over wealth, we over me, character over comfort, service over status, people over possessions, 
positions or pleasures. I know what matters most and I will give it all I've got. I'll do the best I can with what I have for Jesus Christ today. I won't be captivated by culture, manipulated by critics, motivated by praise, frustrated by problems, debilitated by frustration, or intimidated by the enemy. I am a child of God. I have his name. I belong to him. When times get tough and I get tired, I won't back up, back off, back down, back out, or backslide. I'll keep moving forward by God's grace. I'm blood washed, water baptized, and spirit filled. So I cannot be bought. I will not compromise and I shall not quit until I finish the race. I am a trophy of God's grace. So I will be gracious to everyone, grateful for every day, and generous with everything that God has entrusted to me. To my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer in advance is yes. <laughs> Wherever you lead and whatever the cost, I'm ready. Anytime, anywhere, any way, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes. I want to be used by you in such a way that on that final day, I will hear you say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on in and let the eternal party begin. That's who we are, East Wind. We are the apostolics of this day. Would you lift your hands right now and would you declare unto the Lord your identity in him? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We choose you, Lord. We choose your way. We are passionate, God, about the cause of Christ. We seek first the kingdom of God above everything else, Lord. I'm not going to live with regrets or questions, Lord. I live with the joy of a new opportunity to bless the Lord, oh, my soul. I live in the confidence, hallelujah, that I am your child, Lord. I identify with you, Lord. Hallelujah. If you're comfortable doing this, if you're not, it's okay. But if you're comfortable, I wonder right now if you could just pray for your neighbor. Maybe some of you want to step across the aisle. But I believe what we were talking about when we were receiving communion, that it's so critical that we come together as a body of Christ. And I wonder right now if we could just pray for one another. I'm so thankful that I identify with you as my brothers and sisters. Would you begin to pray for one another right now? Would you just pray and link, link your spirits, link your prayers together right now in the name of Jesus? I thank you for it, Lord. I pray for my brother and sister in the name of Jesus.